33 and verse number 7. I want to read through this chapter and then a couple verses uh, in the verse uh, in, in chapter 34, about 20 verses total. It says in Exodus 33, verse number 7, it says, And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that every one which sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. You'll notice that God had a place for them to meet with him. And like the brother was saying before, a lot of people say, well, there's no, there's no direct commandment for a Christian to give tithes and offerings. It doesn't say tithes and offerings, but the command is there. The yeah. insinuation is there. The implication is there. And the principle is there in the Old Testament. Right. And you have the same thing going on with the local church where people will say, well, I don't need to go to a local church. I can meet with God out on my bass boat or my fishing boat or on my couch. No, God still has a place, amen. Yeah, he still has a place for you to be able to meet with other like-minded yes. people and, yeah, and yeah. hear from the Lord. But notice the key was that everyone that, that sought the Lord you got to be seeking the Lord. Amen. Verse number 8, it came to pass when Moses went out into the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. Amen. We're intense tonight, ain't we? The Lord spake unto Moses face to face. As a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. And Moses said unto the Lord, See thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. This is Moses speaking to the Lord. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. And I may be getting ahead of myself here, maybe not, but you know what I like about Moses, and really all the men in the Bible, for the most part, that God uses? They're honest. Yeah. They're honest. Yeah. Uh, Moses ain't getting up here and talking to the Lord in prayer and going, Oh, Heavenly Father, bless me now, I pray. Yeah. That's not what he's doing. Yeah. You know what he's doing? He's talking to God like he would a man, a friend, and he's talking about things he's unsure of yeah. and he's scared about right. and he's worried about. Right. And he's saying things that he doesn't like about the situation. Amen. Aren't you glad you can go to God and be honest? Yeah. That's what Moses is doing right here. He says, you told me someone would go up with me. He says, and now in verse 13, show me thy way that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight. Consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, this is the Lord, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto them, this is Moses, unto him, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. <coughs> For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not that thou goest with us? So we shall be separated, and I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Look down in chapter 34. Chapter 34, verse 1, verses 1 through 9. It says, The Lord said unto Moses, verse 1, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first. And I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. Amen. Aren't you glad, amen, when you broke the commandments of God and gave you another chance to make them right? Yeah. Yeah. And be ready in the morning and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai and present thyself there to be in the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount, neither let the flocks nor herds be before that mount. And he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up unto Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand the two tables of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, this is what the Lord said, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. And Moses made haste and bowed his head unto the earth and worshipped. And he, this is Moses, says, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us. For it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for inheritance. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. And uh, God, we just thank you for tonight, Lord. We thank you just for the good spirit here, Lord, the sweet spirit. Yeah. And uh, God, I know there's some people in here that maybe they're new to the tent meeting. Maybe this is their first time coming. Uh, God, I pray they feel welcome, Lord. And uh, God, I pray, Lord, there be anybody in our midst that's lost and unsaved and on their way to hell that's never been born again. Lord, I pray that they would feel welcome. 
But God, I pray they wouldn't feel comfortable through the preaching and the singing when it goes on. And God, I pray maybe tonight you prick their hearts about salvation. Uh, Lord, maybe there's somebody that's been raised up in church but never put their faith and trust in you, Lord. Uh, maybe it's somebody that's been in church for years and years but never put their faith and trust in you. God, I pray tonight be their night of salvation. But God, I pray for the saints of God, Lord, that came here, Lord, to the tabernacle, to the tent, God. And Lord, they're looking for something, Lord. They, they came hopefully to seek you. And God, I pray, Lord, you give something to them, Lord, from me, God. Not that I'm anything, Lord, but you're everything, God. And I pray, Lord, you do something with this nothing. I pray, God, you anoint me from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet, God. Help me to not say anything that would be displeasing to you. God, I pray, Lord, I'd speak with boldness, meekness, temperance, Lord, and faith, God. Help me not to say anything, Lord, that bring dishonor to your name. But God, help your people, I pray, in Jesus' name. And amen. Yeah. Amen, amen. Moses here makes a very interesting plea and a beg to God. And it's in... Uh, verses 15 and 9, verses uh, 15 and verse 33, and verse number 9 and verse 34, Moses makes a plea to God. And we can read it there in verse 15 of chapter 33. He says this, Moses says unto the Lord, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. Yeah. If thy presence go not with me, carry us up not hence. And then look in verse 34, verse number 9, he says this, this is Moses speaking to the Lord, if, I found, if, if now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, notice this phrase here, go among us. Yeah. Go among us. Moses makes a very interesting plea to the Lord here in his later years in life. Again, he's not a young man, he's not a young buck, and he's not a young whippersnapper. He's not a man that just got started serving the Lord. He's been serving the Lord now for many for, for years, and he's, done, he's already done great and wonderful things for God. Yeah. And he's here at another stage in his life. His life is full of stages. Uh, life is full of growth and development. Life is full of changes and different, different areas of life. And, and Moses is here at this stage in his life. And he, he essentially says this, God, will you please go with me? Yes. Now, ain't that interesting for a grown man to ask God or to ask somebody else and say, will you please go with me? Yeah. Doesn't he almost sound like a little boy talking to his daddy, getting ready to go out to a, a dark field at night? Man, he's a little bit afraid. And he says, Daddy, will you go with me? kind of what it sounds like. Yeah. It sounds like a young man or a young boy that says, man, I just want to know that somebody else is here with me. Yeah. There's a story of a little girl, and she uh, uh, she had all these night terrors and be afraid at nighttime, and her daddy would tell her, honey, Jesus loves you. And uh, he'd lay her down at night and say, Jesus is with you. He'd kiss her on the head and go. He'd uh, leave the door. He'd leave the room, and she'd start screaming, saying, daddy, daddy, come back. And he'd come in, and he'd say, honey, Jesus is with you. Jesus is with you. And uh, he'll take care of you. He'll protect you. He loves you. Good night, honey. And uh, she, he'd go back out, and the same thing would happen. He came in again and he said, he said, honey, he said, not only is Jesus with you, but God the Father is with you. And uh, he said, God the Father is with you. And, and he'd go out the, there in the room and he'd come back in and, and she'd be crying. He'd come back in and he'd say, honey, God the Father is with you. God the Son's with you. God the Holy Spirit's in here with you. He loves you. And he's here with you. And he went back out of the room again and he comes back in for the same reason. And he goes, honey, I told you, God is with you. And she goes, I know, Daddy, but sometimes you just need somebody with a little bit of skin with you. <laughs> he said, I, I, know, I know that they're with me. You know, she, she took off her little spiritual halo. And she said, I know that God's with me, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But she just wanted to know that somebody was with her, amen. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but there are times in my life whenever I, I, I'm asking God, saying, God, are you with me? Yeah. Are you with me? And I want to speak about that subject tonight, going on without God. Yeah. Going on without God. Because see, Moses said, Lord, if you do not go with me, I don't want to go forward. Right. Amen. We've gotten them out of Egypt. We've been saved. I mean, we've walked through the Red Sea and we've done all those things. And I've gotten your commandments already. But God, and I know that you've done things for me already in my past. But God, I don't want to go any further without you going with me. And that's a good concept for everyone in here to consider. Going on without God. As an individual going on without God. As a church going on without God. And as a revival... Going on without God. Can I tell you this, Christian, church, Bible believers? You can go on without God. Yeah. You can. God will let you walk. God will let you walk away. He's not going to hold you down, hold you by your neck. He's not going to beat you over the head, man. No, He will let you. He's a gentleman. If you want to walk away from Him, you can walk away from Him. If you want to walk on, you can walk on. But I'll tell you this, you are going somewhere in life. And you're either going where God is or where God ain't. I know it ain't good English, amen, but... I went to public school and then college, so my English ain't good. Praise the Lord. I need a word processor to spell things, right? But you're either going where God is or you're going where God ain't. You are either going with God or you are going toward without God in your life. But you are going somewhere. I want to go with God. Right. I want to go with God. Wouldn't you hate to go through your whole life 
Only to find out in the end that you were all alone the whole time. Wow. And didn't need to be. Yeah. Wouldn't you hate to go alone in your life, man, and go on in your life, man, with your goals, your plans, your ambitions, your yeah. drive, and base your whole life around something and then get yeah. to the very end and realize it was all in vain, it was all empty, realize that you went through this whole life alone yeah. and you didn't have to. Wouldn't you hate to go off into eternity alone? You know, if you're not saved in here tonight, you know you'll go off into eternity without God. Yeah. You will go on without God. God will finally say, you have had your last chance to be saved. You have had your last chance to believe on my son. You have had your last chance to get right with me. And he will no longer give you another chance. And you can go off into eternity without God. You can go on without God in your life and eternity in your, in your home and in your marriage, at your job, in your church. You can be religious and not have God's presence. Right. Can't you? Yeah. I just make fun of them a little bit. I don't mean to be rude and crude, but I'm sorry. But I, I, you better thank God you're in a Baptist church tonight. Could you imagine doing this in this environment at a Catholic church? Uh, yeah. So I thought being hot, man, lulling yeah. you to sleep. Yeah. If I just got up here and went, I'm at home. I'm at home. <laughs> You fall right asleep. Right. You fall right asleep. There's all kinds of religious people, and they don't have God's presence around them. Right. You can go on being religious without God's presence. You can go on being a church without God's presence. You ever wonder how there are people in church, but for some reason they don't seem to enjoy it? Yeah. Yeah. About that. Have you ever wondered that? Yeah. Have you ever wondered how you'll be in church, you'll be in a church service, and they'll get to singing some song about, He is the Son of God. Yeah. Jesus is his name. And you want to say, Aaron, why do they clarify his name? Because in the Old Testament Proverbs, it says, Who is his son and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? In the Old Testament, they're looking for a son and what his name was. And they said he's, he's the son of God. And you'll see a bunch of crazy, lunatic, fanatic weirdos, a, a bunch of cult members, man, yeah. doing stuff like this. Yeah. You say, who are they waving at? They're doing this, that, and the other. They're standing up and clapping. You say, Aaron, why are they doing that? They're enjoying it. Yeah. God's with them. They're hearing songs about how God is with Daniel. They're thinking that the same God of yesterday is the God of today. And the way that he closed that lion's mouth there for Daniel, he's closed the lion's mouth for me. And they get to read, they, they get to hear those songs and it does something for them. People start preaching and teaching on the word of God and people start saying, amen, that's right. Because there's something inside of them. There is somebody inside of them. And whenever someone moves in, you'll get excited when they start talking about him. And then you have other people where all that's going on, they're sitting there going... Like I say, my, my, my therapeutic instinct kicks in. And if I see a patient, they're sitting there on the edge of the bed and they're going like this. You know what I do? I go and check their pulse. I see if they're alive. Yeah. And I don't get, man, how you can come into a place with saints of God that are 2024, whenever the average person doesn't give a rip about church, and you're around yeah. a bunch of people, man, that are still sticking by the stuff, yeah. that are still preaching out the King James Bible, that still like old-time fashioned worship and praise and standards, man. I don't know how you can't get excited. Right. Amen. At least wiggle your toe or something yeah. in the seat, man. At least yeah. put a finger up yeah. or two fingers up. Put a hand. Do something, man. Yeah. Yeah. You saying what is that? Some people have God with them, and others don't. And you can be in church and God not be with you. There's not a lonelier feeling in this world than to be around other people and to feel alone. Yeah, right. Whether it's in your marriage or your home, man, whether you're a child or a spouse, it doesn't matter, or whether you're a Christian in a church, there's nothing worse than being around other people and feeling alone. I don't want to feel alone anymore. Right, yeah. I felt alone long, long enough, man. I want God with me. Wouldn't you hate, man, to go on without God with you? Now, I understand. I know I'm talking to a bunch of Baptists. And I understand i got to clarify this. I understand in the New Testament, God does not leave you. I get that. Are we good? I know some of you are closing your Bibles up saying, I'm not listening. He's talking about he's been around those free will Baptists for too long up there in Columbus. He thinks you can lose your salvation. No. I understand the Old Testament, God's spirit could come upon a man and leave him like he did Samson. David said, remove not thy spirit from me. I know that Moses here is talking about God's presence. I understand that God said he would show up physically one day in the Old Testament, and he did through Jesus Christ. Yeah. I understand that he said in the Old Testament book of Joel, and then Jesus said in the New Testament, I will show up to you in my spirit, and that's the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I understand that the promise of the sealing of the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 1, chapter 13, he says, whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption. I get that. 
Yeah. I get a New Testament saint is sealed. They are sealed. You can't do nothing about that once you get saved. Amen. Yeah. 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 Don't tell your Calvinist friends. They'll say, oh, you said you can't do nothing about that, right? You believe in irresistible grace? No, I didn't say that. I said, once you are saved by free will, yeah. Yeah. you can't do nothing about going to heaven. You're going to heaven. Amen. But I will say this. A New Testament believer in a church age does not lose his or her sealing. But they can and they do lose from time to time their filling. Right. And that is a Pauline epistle doctrine. Yes. Right. In Ephesians chapter 319, his prayer for that great church at Ephesus was, I am my prayer for you, wherefore I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And he goes on through his prayer list for him. And then he says that you would be filled with all the fullness of God. Yeah. Yeah. Why would Paul pray for something for them to do something if they already had it? Right. Yeah. Why would he say my prayer is for you to be full if they were already full? Right. He says already in Ephesians chapter 5, 18, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled. That's a commandment. Be filled with the Spirit of God. Yeah. Yeah. In Philippians 1, 4, or 1, 11, he says, Being filled with the fruits of righteousness. Now, if we're being honest, like I always tell people, take your halos off, put your angel wings in for just a minute for me. Could you say 24-7 you're filled with righteousness? 24-7. Uh, you ain't never had someone cut you off in traffic? <laughs> and you thought some things where, boy, for just five seconds I could... Lose my salvation to get it right back. There's some things I like to say and do. Then you remember you got KJV bumper stickers on the rear of your car. And you smile at them like this. You're not filled with righteousness all the time. I'm not filled with righteousness all the time. Colossians 1 9 says, uh, For this day, uh, since the day we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you, the church, and desire. This was Paul's desire for the New Testament church that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Why would Paul pray for them to be filled with the knowledge of his will, God's will, if they had it already? Because they didn't have it. There is a difference, and I didn't go through the book of Acts because I'm among Bible believers. As soon as you say the book of Acts, they go, well, 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 hold on now. It's a transitional book. I understand that. So we'll ignore the ten different times that says the New Testament church was filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with the Holy Ghost, yeah. filled with the Holy Ghost, yeah. filled with the Holy Ghost, 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 filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. It was pretty important for the New Testament church. All right. But there is a difference between being sealed and being filled, and there is a difference between being saved and full of the Holy Ghost. And I believe this tonight, church. I truly do believe it. And I know I'm, I'm addressing a topic that I can't fulfill. I can't totally lift it up. I can't totally expound on it. I'm just going to barely scratch the surface to it. And I understand that. But I believe the majority of Christians today, and I might even go as far as to say this, maybe half the Christians in here, but the majority of Christians today in the church across the world are not filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'd say about half the folks in here aren't either. The last church in Revelation was having church services with Jesus on the outside. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They had their building. They had their program. They had the organization set up. They had the laity. The, the, uh, uh, they had their uh, laymen set up. They had all those things set up. They had all the structure. They're the most well-off church. They're the richest church. They have all the material goods. And it says, I am behold, I stand at the door and knock. Yeah. They were having church without God's presence. Yeah. Yeah. Paul asked the church at Corinth, he said, Know ye not that your body, uh, uh, that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? And then he tells them, Examine yourselves, whether ye be of the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Christ is in you, except you be reprobates? They didn't know. Right. They didn't know that Christ was in them. <laughs> and I ask you this, this this evening, Christian, is Christ in you? I hope he is. I hope tonight you can say, Aaron, I am filled with his presence. Here's a quick test for you. This is an inner test. Take your own test. Don't look on anyone else's paper, man. Don't cheat. Don't look across the aisle. Don't look, at any pew. Don't look across the pew or anything like that. Don't think about something, something, someone else in your head. But here's a quick little test. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll be filled with Jesus Christ. You'll love some things. You'll love, number one, His Son. Yeah. 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 You will love Jesus Christ. And like He said before, you'll want to talk to Him. Yeah. I talked to my wife this morning before I left for work. I sat down with a cup of coffee. I ate my breakfast bar. The children ate their uh, breakfast. And my wife and I talked for about five, ten minutes before I left. I texted my wife while I was at work today. I talked to her on the way down here. I'm going to talk to her on the way back up. I'm going to talk to her whenever I get home tonight. Yeah. You say, why? I love her. Yeah. Yeah. Do not give me this baloney. Yeah. Right. That you can wake up and live a whole day without reading and talking to your husband. Yeah. Your bridegroom. Right. Don't give me that. I don't have time for it. You don't have time for him. Right. 
He literally died for you. Right. He gave everything for you. You don't have time to spend 10 minutes talking to Him. Right. Do you love reading His Word? Do you love praying to Him? Yeah. I'm asking you if you're full tonight. Yeah. My wife doesn't have to poke and prod me to talk to her. And if she does, you want to know why? I've got other things on my mind that are more important to me than her. And you want to know why you won't get in this book and you will not pray? And it's because there are things that are more important to that heart that's beating inside of you. And that heart right now is beating. And your mind is saying, don't worry about it. And your heart says something's wrong. And your mind says, no, it's not. It's fine. And your heart says, yes, I feel something that is going on inside of me. Romans 2.15, their thoughts, the meanwhile, either accusing or excusing themselves. Yeah. God starts speaking to your heart, and your heart, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And the heart is deceitful above all things. God speaks to your heart first. What happens is that you have the mind of this world right now. Or you, if you're saved, you no longer have it. But your mind will start saying, no, it's okay. You'll start excusing yourself. Yeah. And saying, it's okay. It's okay that I'm doing that. And you'll start reasoning among yourself. Do you love reading your Bible? Do you love praying? Do you love church? Yeah. Do you love church? You say, Aaron, I don't do you know, Church is okay. It's kind of boring, this, that, and the other. Man, you know what y'all do tonight? I'm going to give advice from Brother Jack Wood. So, another cover your children's ears. You know what Jack Wood said to his church? He goes, he goes you know the problem with some of you? He said, you need to go out tonight and just get drunk. Get in a bar fight. Get your face beat up a little bit. Wake up in a jail cell, jail cell tomorrow. He goes, maybe you'll enjoy coming to church. <laughs> Ain't nothing like waking up in a jail cell with a bloody nose and a bruised eye you can't have to see out of and all your money's gone and your breath stinks and this, that, and the other and you got stuff on you that you don't know what it is. Yeah. You know, being in church, I'd rather be here tonight than anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think this is unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Not because I'm up here preaching, man, but I, I'm, I'm in church right now. Yeah. I know where I was. Yes. Yeah. I know where I could be. Do you love coming to church, man? Do you love coming to church? Do you love the saints? Do you love the Son? Do you love the Scriptures? Do you love the, uh, the saints of God? Do you believe God wants to do something? That's a good test to figure out whether or not you're filled. And the question comes up, back to Exodus 33, the question comes up, why did Moses ask this question? Why did a grown man that's nearly 80 years old say, God, are you going to go up with me? Two reasons quickly. Maybe number one, it was right after Exodus 32. What happened back in Exodus 32? He made the golden calf, remember? He's up there praying on the mountain, and they come back down, and Joshua, his right-hand man, uh, Joshua, the minister of the Lord there, minister of Moses, uh, they come down that mountain, and Moses says, what's going on down there? And Joshua says, it's war, there's battle. And he goes, no, Joshua, it's not battle. He said, they're playing down there, they're playing music. The people sin, and they ask for an idol. Aaron agrees, Moses' his brother and right-hand man. And Aaron not only makes them an idol, but I don't know if you ever noticed it, Aaron makes them all naked on top of it. Yeah. Holy Ghost puts that in there in parentheses back in Exodus 32. Aaron confesses to Moses what he did. If you go back there and read it, in parentheses, the Holy Ghost puts in a parenthetical thought. He says, for they were all naked, for Moses, or Aaron had made them naked. Yeah. Usually people won't tell you the whole truth and nothing about the truth. They'll leave a little bit out. Amen. Yeah. And uh, Aaron blames everyone else. He says, the people, the people, like Adam did with Eve. Moses burns the calf, grinds it down to powder, makes them all drink it. How do you like that for church discipline? Amen. Makes them all drink it. And Moses has the Levites slay everyone who is not on their side. Could you imagine if the pastor stood up tonight? All right, here we go. Here's a line right down the middle. You're either with Bible Believers Baptist Church or you're not. And if you're not with us, Brother Ed, Brother Richard, I want you to take out your... Well, I'm not going to say what to take out. I mean, you just keep those concealed right now. Praise God. you got to be careful saying take those things out. Oh, look, mountain of the heartbeat. Praise God. Anyways, imagine if you said that. That's what Moses said. He said, kill them if they're not with us. You better cut off people in your life that ain't getting you closer to God. Right. Maybe Moses was scared that God was angry with them. And his fear of disappointing God made him afraid that God was going to leave them. You know fear of disappointing God is a good motivator to live right? right. Yeah. You ought to be afraid of God. Yeah. You ought to be afraid of Him. You ought to be afraid of disappointing Him. You say, why? Because I love Him? Yeah, that too. Because <laughs> you're afraid of Him messing you up and if you do wrong. And people say, well, I don't think you should be afraid of God, man. I don't think you should just I don't think you should live for it just because you're afraid of disappointing. Well, you don't want to apply that to anywhere else, your teachers, your boss, your coaches, your spouse, man. You don't want to disappoint them either. All right. 
Moses was likely scared that he disappointed God and that God's people disappointed God. He was afraid that God would not go with them. If you have sin in your life that you know God is not pleased with, you know what you can do tonight? Come down to an altar and say, God, are you still with me? Are you still with me? Because I've done some things that I shouldn't have done. God, are you still with me? Maybe, number one, not only because he was afraid of what happened, maybe it was because it was after Exodus 33. We didn't read verses 1, 1 through 11 or all those verses there. But God had just spoken to Moses. Maybe Moses asked this question. He was afraid of disappointing God. Maybe it's because he had just spoken to God face to face as a man speaketh to a man with a cloudy pillar around. And it was so wonderful and so supernatural that Moses' face literally shone and it scared the children of Israel. Moses has to come down. My mother gave me this. It's a cold washcloth. He had to come down off that mountain like this. And as Moses came down that mountain, the people started stepping back from him. They started doing this to him. They couldn't look at him. And he had to put a veil over his face because his face shone. You want to know why? Yeah. He had been that close to God. Yeah. Yeah. He felt his presence. He could, he could almost hear him, man, audibly as he walked by there. And he hit the cleft of that rock. And, and God walked by and he said, you can't see my face, Moses. Nobody's ever seen it and lived. And he said, but I've got a place. I love, I love up there in Exodus 33. He says, i got a place beside me. <laughs> if you're in Christ, you're beside God. And he said, there's a place beside me in that, in that cleft. And he goes, you go hide yourself in that cleft, man. Go get down there in that cleft, Moses. And he goes, and I'm going to walk past you. He said, you can see my hinder parts. And, and Moses looked there and he just saw, I don't know what he saw, man, but he saw something. Yeah. And he felt something. And he heard something. And maybe the reason why Moses has God saying, God, are you still with me? Because Moses never wanted to lose that feeling. And I'll tell you this, Christian, if you ever get that close to God, you won't ever want anything else. If you ever get close enough to God, man, to feel his goodness and to feel his forgiveness and to almost hear it, I know we don't hear it audibly. I never will forget, man, March or May of 2000. 16, I think it was. I was driving back man, from this meeting on a Sunday night. I was, in, I was in tears the whole time driving back. As soon as I left, I was in tears crying. And I was driving up 62 and I, I stopped off at that exit there. I went to the speedway and just tears rolled down my eyes under conviction. I called my dad and said, I don't know what's wrong with me. And he said, what all dads do. He makes you feel stupid. Amen for asking. He goes, son, you're under conviction. <laughs> I act like I didn't know. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I'm just crying. I'm controlled. I must have had a, a cafe mocha latte or something. I had one of those feminine drinks at Starbucks. It made me emotional. <laughs> I remember he said, Aaron, he goes, you need to get in church. Yeah. He told me everything I already knew. Yeah. Most of the time, God would just tell you everything you already knew. A lot of you tonight have problems in your life, but you don't know what the issue is. You know what the issue is. God's already showed it to you. Yeah. Come down to an altar and say, Lord, I know what I need to do. And I remember, man, getting there. I, went, I got off the phone with him. I went to Speedway. I'm crying, trying to you know, use the restroom and everything. And I, I'm walking out. I get back in that 2001 Honda Accord. I'm driving up that road, man. And I remember getting on that entry ramp to 71 North. And I wasn't all the way up yet. And I thought, I, can, I can't go on. I can't go on anymore. And I stopped that car and I pulled it over there on the, on the entry ramp, man. And, and I remember, man, just breaking it. And I remember hearing that voice. Man, I know it wasn't audible, but it sure felt like it. And I remember hearing those words, Aaron, come home. Come home. Aaron, come home. And that's all that it took, man, was for me to hear that voice. I went home, man, got down on my bedroom floor and laid out, man, with my Bible, the only Bible I could find. I was holding that thing. I just cried with it. Holding that thing, kissing that thing, man, shedding tears over that thing that I've been neglecting for years. That thing I've been running from, man, and just talking to God. I have people ask me all the time, I mean, I, God's, been, God's been good to me. He really has. I don't know about you, but He's been good to me. And uh, God's, I mean, I grew up in a Christian home with my, my dad, man. He got to preach with all the grace. He got to preach for Don Green and, and just different men, man, across the country from east to west coast, north and south, preaching four week long meetings. I got to grow up around good preaching, good music, man, all those things, man. And I, I got to go to college. I got the, the job that I got a dream. I'm an occupational therapist. I love it. I got a wife, two beautiful boys, man. They'll be here tomorrow night. I got cars. I got two cars. I got a house, man. I got a. I got me a little garden now. I'm planting. I, I mean, I got friends. I got peace of mind. Yeah. 
Y'all said amen to that one. Why didn't you say amen to the other one? Pray. <laughs> yeah, you scared us there for a little while. I'm going to go and preach in August out in California, Brother Gene Hall Kim's. And I'm going to take my wife and children out there on the plane. And we're going to fly out there and see the redwoods and stuff for a little vacation, two or three days. And then we're going to be at this camp meeting. I get to preach. And anytime I get to preach somewhere in another church, I'm driving usually to it or flying. This is what I think in my head. What am I doing? Yeah. Do they know who I am? Yeah. They're having me preach? Okay. <laughs> Probably out of the Lord's will, Pastor, but I'll do it. And I'm thinking, who am I to get to preach over there? And then about a month ago, I got to preach in Maryland, so I've preached on both coasts so far. Yeah. I got to preach in Maryland, and a little church startup. They had 15 people usually coming here and there. He said, whenever I came that Sunday, they had 30, and they've had 30 ever since. They're looking for a bigger building now. Not because I did anything. God just brought in 15 visitors, and they all liked it, and they all stayed. And uh, God's given us this little church building, and and uh, I just had a pastor call me, brother Ron Ralph. He's one of my heroes. He's got a church down there, 350, 400 people or so, evangelistically speaking. Probably has 300 actually, but evangelistically 350 or 400. And uh, he had me in about a month ago, and I got to I got to speak at his church on Satan's devices. Yeah. God's been good to me. Yeah. I've got to lead little elderly women to the Lord at a nursing home and hold their little hand yeah. and pray with them. And they accept Christ, and I feel that squeeze whenever they finally do it. And uh, I've got to street preach at Ohio State football games and have people throw beers at me. I've got to preach at the pride parades and have them do all kinds of stuff to me and just preach up and pro or stand up and proclaim the gospel. God's just been good to me. Yeah. But Christian, I'll tell you this. I've said it before and I'll just keep telling people, the greatest time in my life have not been behind a pulpit. Yes, right. Yeah. Greatest time in my life, man, it's not been with my children, although those times have been good. The greatest times in my life have not been at a nursing home leading somebody to the Lord or preaching man out on the street corner. The best times in my life have been whenever I was alone with God. Yeah. Yeah. And God spoke to me. Because yeah. yeah. he read the verses, man, but why in the world is a God that, that owns the cattle on a thousand hills? And all the riches in the world, man, he doesn't need anything and he don't even need me. And he's going to come to where I am and talk to me. I've gone to a place, Brother Jeff, and I'm not saying anything spooky, but I've gone to a place where I've been fasting and praying, and, and I'll be in that, that secret place, that closet, man, and, and there's no sound going on. i got a fan playing in the background for noise, so I don't hear any distractions, and I'm laying there, and I'm just curled up in that Bible where I'm praying, man, and all of a sudden, it's just like the Holy Spirit says, stop talking. Yeah. Someone's here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You don't need to talk. And you just let the greatest form of worship, man, is laying prone and not saying anything. Yeah. You say, Aaron, what does it for you in the Christian life? That. Yeah. That. Whenever I know God is with me. And you know Moses had God's promise that he'd be with him. You know what he asked as an old man? He says, Lord, are you still with me? You know what you'd ask God tonight and say, Lord, am I going on without you? Maybe you've been going on for days without him. Maybe weeks without him. Maybe months or maybe years. Or maybe you never, you never have known if he's with you. You know what I do tonight? I make sure God's with you. You know as much as I love y'all, and I do love you, and I do love coming down here. If I'd come down here and God wouldn't show up, it'd be a waste of drive. An hour and 40 minutes. But I want God to show up. I want God to be with us. Maybe God... Maybe the reason why Moses asked this question was that he felt God's presence. He knew what it was like. And he wasn't happy with anything else. He wanted God to go with him. Emmanuel, God wants to be with us. Emmanuel means God with us. God promised he'd be with us. He wants to be with us. He said in Proverbs 1.24, he says, I have called, but ye have refused. I've stretched out my hand, and no man regarded me. Meaning, I've reached out to you, but no man took my hand. And Isaiah 66, I believe it is, or 64, verse 6, I can't remember. He says, no, there's no man that stirreth up himself to take hold of me. Yeah. You know what God's doing tonight? He's laying a hand out. And he's saying, I've stretched out my hand for you. You know what the saddest truth is in the word of God? Is that God wants to spend more time with you and me than what yeah. we want to spend with him. Yeah. Yeah. And God's saying, America. Yes, yeah. sir. Here's my hand. Yeah. It's stretched out. Bible Believers Baptist Church. Here's my hand. 
But you know what he said? He said, no man regarded it, meaning no man took his hand. You know Christ's hands tonight, sinner, are still outstretched? Yes, Amen. And you want to know why I can't save you? And this pastor can't save you? And a Baptist denomination can't save you? Or a priest can't save you? We don't have the scars in our hands to save you. But there's somebody tonight, man, where he doesn't have a, a, a watch on. <laughs> All that he has on his hands are two scars. Amen. You know what they're saying that tonight? They're saying, I'll go with you. I'll go with you. Emmanuel means God with it. God wants to be with us. Yeah. And I understand that the Holy Spirit never leaves a Christian. I understand that we're sealed, but you can quench and grieve Him so much that He no longer strives, no longer talks with you. You can become reprobate in your mind, man. You can get to a place where you're past feeling. The Bible says uh, spiritual hypothermia. I believe you preach it. Hypothermia, you, get, you finally get to a place where you're freezing to death where you can't feel anything. Neuropathy in your feet, man, and in your hands is a dangerous thing. Whenever you can't feel those things, you can get burns and you can fall. It messes up your balance and your walk when you can't feel anything. Depression. People get to a place where they don't, have, they don't feel their emotions anymore. That's a dangerous thing to not feel, feel anything. It's a dangerous thing. I, I've, I've only been pastoring for two years, not even two years. And I've had to counsel more couples than ever before. I've never even really counseled couples before. I always counsel single folks and younger folks. And uh, I've had couples, man, I've talked to it, and I don't, I don't put all our business out there, but they sit there and they, they tell you stuff that happened, and you go, yeah. wow. Yeah. I heard of, you know, men in the mission off the street beating the living snot out of people. I've never heard of a husband and wife doing it that are in church every Sunday, smiling. It's yeah. good to know, though. And I counsel them. I try and help different folks. But you know what's the scariest place? There's one couple right now I'm thinking of. They both said this to me. They both said, I just don't care anymore. Yeah. You know you can help somebody if they still care. Yeah. Yeah. But when they get to the place, the place where they don't care anymore, you can't really help them. Right. I got a young man right now, a pastor's son, homosexual. He's one of the two I've talked to. Uh, by, you know, Bible believers and everything. Believe the same things you do. Act the same way you act, dress the same way you act. They raise their kids the same way you raise yours, and they're homosexual. And uh, the one there's still hope for, he still has feelings about. The other one told me, he said, Aaron, I just don't care about anything. I don't care about it. And I told him, I said, well, I can't help you. It's a scary thing whenever you get past feeling a Christian. It's a scary thing whenever you don't feel anymore. And you say, are you trying to get an emotional response out of me? No. But I am asking you this. When was the last time you had an emotional response to anything spiritual? When was the last time you wept like Jesus did over your city? When was the last time, man, whenever you saw the unbelief of other people like Jesus did in, in John chapter 11? And it says that Jesus wept. He didn't weep because of Lazarus. He didn't weep because they were weeping. He may have. Maybe he did feel empathetic towards them and sympathetic and he hated that they were crying. Maybe he just wept though because he had been telling them and telling them that he was the resurrection and the life. If they believe in him, that he would be able to raise them from the dead. Maybe he was just crying over their unbelief. Right. You know, we could use some folks that would cry over the unbelief of the church today. You say, Aaron, it's a scary thing when a person gets past feeling, but Aaron, why do we need God with us? It's all there in the text. I'm not going to preach on them, but 34 verse 9, you find out why you need God with us. Number 1 in verse 34 verse 9, it says we're a stiff-necked people. They're stubborn. You want to know why you need God with you? Because you're stubborn. Moses pastored the largest Baptist church known to man, 2 million Baptists. And he knew this about Baptists. They're stubborn. They're stiff-necked. And they're sinful. In verse 9, he says, pardon our iniquity. You want to know why you need God's presence with you? Because you are sinful and you are stubborn and you will get set in your ways. And you will get so set in your ways that you will think you're serving God right. But you're not. He says, pardon our iniquity for we're sinful. He says in verse 16 of chapter 33, he says in verse 16 of chapter 33, he says, so shall we be separated. Thirdly, the reason why you need God with you is you need to be separated from this world. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be like this world. I know people look at colleges and they look at men with degrees and everything. And I understand I have degrees and things like that. People, for some reason, as soon as you get BS after your name, they think that you're something special. BS, anyways, they got BS after your name, bachelor's of science and other letters, this, that, and the other. And you say something, they go, ooh, wow, he's educated. You ever seen what the educated crowd's doing? They're breaking into a place and then telling the people that who's building they broke into they're saying you owe, you owe us food and water yeah. yeah 
By the way, you're paying for their education. Yeah. Your taxpayer money. Yeah. I don't want to be like that world. Hey. I want to be separated. I want to be different. And in chapter 34, verse 9, he says this. The reason why we ought to want God to go with us. We're sinful. We're stubborn. We ought to want to be separated. We ought to want to be different in this world. And in verse 9 of chapter 34, he says, Take us for thine inheritance. An inheritance. You ought to, be, you ought to want God to go with you, fourthly, for his spoils. His spoils, his riches. An inheritance is something owned by an individual that is passed down to another, something that is possessed or enjoyed. And Moses is saying, God, I want you to go with us because I want to be part of your inheritance. Moses was saying, God, I want you to own me. Yeah. You want to know why you owe him, like he talked about? Because he owned you. Yeah. Yeah. And Moses wanted to be owned and he wanted to be enjoyed by God. Yeah. That's what an inheritance is. It's something that someone else enjoys. And I don't know about you, Christian, but I want God to enjoy me. Right. I want him to enjoy me. How many of y'all in here are parents tonight? Amen. Amen. A lot of men here. How many of y'all, if you're being honest, there are some of your children that you enjoy more often than your other children? <laughs> some of your children you did not enjoy so much at the time, and the majority of the time, as you did the other children. Now you can say, I love them all equally. Well, that, according to the Bible, some of, they love their children differently. Point being is this, I want to be one of God's children he loves and enjoys. Wow. And maybe Moses just thought that he assumed that if he had God's blessing and his inheritance, that anything that God had was better than what he had. Yeah. And child of God, God's will and God's blessing for your life are far better and greater than anything you have planned for it. Yeah. Right. Moses, it said, by faith when he was born, he was hid three months of his parents. They saw he was a proper child. They were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he came to years, when he grew up, Refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with God's people, uh, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of his reward. Moses just thought that if I follow God, it'll all be worth it. And I can guarantee you tonight, Christian, anything you give up for God, it'll be worth it. Yeah. And he says lastly there, in verse number 14, why you ought to want God to go with you? Because you're stubborn, you're stiff necked, you're separated, amen, I am too. You ought to want God to go with you because you want his spoils and his riches. And in verse number 14, chapter 33, he says this, he says, my presence, chapter 33, verse 14, he says, my presence will go up with thee. And he says, I will give thee rest. You ought to want God to go up with you, not just for his spoils, but for his serenity. His rest. He says, I will give you rest. I will give you peace and quietness. I'll give you stillness. I'll give you a permanent habitation, a place to stay. A state free from motion or disturbance, a state of reconciliation with God. And Christian, I'll ask you this tonight. If she can come, she can come up and start playing something softly on the piano. Would you define your life? Would you describe your life and your mind and your mental state, your psychological state, your heart? Would you describe that as a place of rest? Because if not, God is not with you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and anxiety, pain, worry, and fret. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. Yes. Your life, your marriage, your home ought to be a state of peace and quietness, a place of rest. And whenever God is with you and God's presence is with you, it can quiet the storms. And I ask you, like I asked you in the beginning, are you going on without God? Are you going on without God? Is God with you? You say, Aaron, how do I get God's presence? Same way Moses did. Ask for it. Look for it. It says Joshua stayed in the tabernacle after everybody had left. Would you come down to an altar tonight and say, God, I've gone on without you. you admit to God, saying, God, I've gone on without you. I'm making decisions right now, and you are not with me. And so everybody like that tonight, you say, Aaron, why are you not having you bow your head? I want you to stare at me. If you're completely filled up with the Holy Spirit, and your mind is at peace tonight, there's nothing you're worried about. You're not worried about bills or nothing. Stay in your seat. If you know right now in your ministry you're in the perfect will of God and don't have any questions about it, stay in your seat. 
and you're not fretting over the state of our nation because you know God's in control, you stay in your seat. Stay in your seat. If you got up and read your Bible this morning and loved it, stay in your seat. You're going to wake up tomorrow morning and you know you're going to pray and love it, stay in your seat. You don't have to come. God's with you. Anybody tonight, though, would say, Aaron, God's not with me. Do we got to bow our heads? The invitation's open. You know what Paul or Stephen said?